first thing I want to do is make sure everybody understands I'm not a horticulturist. Oh, okay. I just happen to live in an old house. I happen to be Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, my wife's also of German ancestry. And, and so our house is 200 years old and we just kind of started to try to make everything as, as period appropriate as we could. And that eventually spread into the garden too. And that's when we started doing research on how did the, our ancestors, the Pennsylvania Dutch, some people call them Pennsylvania German, how did they, how did they garden? So what I'm going to do today is talk to you a little bit about what I've learned from visiting places, looking on the internet, getting books, talking to people. Uh, up here is a picture of my garden, and you can't see it very well, and that's good, because <laughs> that picture was taken in 2008, and since then I've, I've converted it to the traditional Pennsylvania uh, four-square garden. So I'll show you a picture of that later, but it's not mine, unfortunately. <clears throat> Interesting enough, the dogs are what got me doing garden presentations. Because about five years ago, I was at a school in Bucks County giving a dog sledding presentation as part of an enrichment program. And between classes, one of the teachers was talking to me and asked, what do you do when you're not dog sledding? I said, I garden. She gardens. Next thing you know, we're talking about different things, gardening. And then she finds out we're trying to grow all heirlooms, Pennsylvania Dutch gardening methods. Etc. 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 The next thing I know, she's conned me into coming down to another historical society. I think it was Rock Hill in Bucks, in Bucks County, and then churches got a hold of it, and other yeah. historical societies. So it started with dog sledding demonstrations, and now it's dog sledding demonstrations and uh, and gardening talks. Today we talk about why I'm interested in Pennsylvania Dutch methods. I'm going to use Pennsylvania Dutch and Pennsylvania German interchangeably. Hope that doesn't offend anybody. I'm actually going to say Pennsylvania Dutch 99.9% .9 of the time because that's what it was when I was growing up. Uh, I'll talk about the mechanics of a Pennsylvania Dutch garden and then the vegetables, so the heirloom varieties that they used to grow. <clears throat> Why? Why? I can tell you when my kids were younger, it annoyed the daylights out of them that we were, uh, that we were uh, interested in heirloom vegetables and trying to garden the way our ancestors did. It, it annoyed them to the point that when their friends came over, they kind of like, stay away from my father, he's nuts. That's right. So, so why? Well, as I already told you, both of my family, both my family and my wife's family is from southwest Germany, actually the Alsace-Lorraine area. Uh, my family lost their family farm, which was near Nazareth, during the Depression, and everybody moved to Bethlehem. My wife's family is still farming in upstate New York around Loudville, which nobody knows where it is because there's, you know where Loudville is. I do. And how do you know where Loudville is? I used to live in Syracuse, New York. Okay, all right. <laughs> because there's more cows in Loudville than there are people. Yes. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so, and more snowmobiles. Yeah. Uh, we also, I, I guess, are trying to be as sustainable as possible with our, with our lives. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going overboard. Uh, when I have to use uh, pesticides because things are out of control, I will. But, but we do try to, to use low input methods, which means uh, you try to keep the soil healthy year on year, try to put stuff into the soil so that we're not using uh, too much uh, industrial type fertilizers. Okay? Also, we try to avoid buying food that's been shipped long distances. I'll give you some statistics on that in a minute, which kind of surprised me when I saw them. And we do grow vegetables to preserve the diversity of the gene pool. Something else a lot of people may not realize is if you grow your own vegetables and you save your seeds year to year, they will adapt specifically to the microclimate that, that you're growing them in. And you will get higher yields after four or five years of saving seeds and growing them. So it's, it's worth it if you're a serious garden for that long. <coughs> Uh, one of the things you'll, you'll read about a lot is, is the hybrids, hybrid vegetables generally are, are known to have better taste than uh, the commercial varieties. And that's because your growing vegetables 100 years ago, did I say that reverse? Yeah, I think you did. <laughs> My brain's saying that wasn't right, back up. <laughs> backspace, backspace, backspace. Backspace, thank you, yes. Yes, it's the, it's the heirlooms that, that generally taste better than the hybrids because uh, back when people were growing their own food, they would select seeds from the plants that, that had the desirable characteristics. 
people weren't concerned so much about what they looked like, they concerned about how they yielded and what, how they tasted and how well they held their, their flavor and their quality. And, and so that's what you got from the arrows. Some of the tomatoes, well at least the one, the Howard German that's over there is one of the ugliest tomatoes you will ever see. But if you make your own paste, you ought to consider the Howard German tomato as an option. Uh, it's, a, it's a very dry tomato with a very small seed pocket. So it's, it's a lot easier than taking a beef steak and trying to boil that down. <laughs> And we live in a 190-year-old farmhouse now, and we're trying to be more self-sufficient, and it just seems nice to have the traditional garden out next to the house than, than what we used to have. Okay, uh, here, here's my boring facts on sustainability. Okay, 70% of U.S. energy consumption goes into agriculture. That shouldn't be a, a big surprise. Anyway. Agriculture is very energy intensive, especially when you consider the first fertilizers and the insecticides most of which are made from petrochemical products. Four-fifths of the total, four-fifths of that 70% is actually used to ship food. Okay? If you think about it, an awful lot of what we eat that we buy in the grocery stores coming from California or Florida. And California's not looking good this year. No. The droughts, uh, Seriously. So if you're not growing a garden, you might want to consider it. Just <laughs> Each item, each item, <coughs> this one blows me away, each item in a typical U.S. meal has traveled 1,500 miles. That's on average. And that's because of the fact that so much of our food is also imported. <clears throat> so what can you do? Eat and buy local. You see an awful lot of restaurants that are right now pushing the fact that they sell locally grown food. We, when we go out to eat, we do try to go to those restaurants. If each of us ate one meal per week of locally raised organic food, we would reduce our oil consumption by 1.1 million barrels per week. That's a phenomenal number. Okay. And that's doable. That's, that's easily doable, yes. <coughs> uh, the other thing that Carolyn and I try to do is we try to eat as much in season as possible. Uh, part of that is, again, to try to understand what it was like for our ancestors who, who weren't going to have tomatoes in January February. And part of that is just, I guess, just to see if we can do it. Which means we're growing some of the stuff that people don't eat that much anymore, like rhubarb. Uh, asparagus, people still eat a lot of it, but we're growing it. <coughs> Winter squash is really big in our house because you can put them in the root cellar and you can eat them for 10 months after you harvest them. <clears throat> we maximize our use of personal garden inputs. Uh, we compost all of our vegetable and lawn waste. Uh, we heat ha the back half of our house with wood stoves. We have three wood stoves. Uh, we, we take the wood off of our own land. So, so at this point, we're, we're not we're not going to we're not using so much wood that the forest is going to go over it. But we'll put the ashes in the garden because they're a good source of potash. Uh, I mentioned earlier my daughter was an equestrian at Penn State. When she moved to Baton Rouge, she was good enough to leave her two horses with us, so we still have plenty of horse manure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we save our own seats. Just a bit about how we do it and what we do. Now, there's probably people here that remember different things from when they were growing up that are going to conflict with this. Let's talk about it, because I'm always trying to hear what people have experienced. So I'm going to tell you what, if you go to a typical book, or you go to a demonstration garden, what they say is the way the Pennsylvania Dutch typically handle their gardens. I've run into many people who, who grew up with something totally different. Okay, so this is not the only way, mm -hmm. but it appears to have been a common way. And I'd love to hear your stories of what you saw. Kitchen and field gardens, they had two, two gardens, okay? The kitchen garden grew vegetables. The field garden was for their main crops. Or, excuse me, there's, there's space hogs that cabbage, potatoes, corn, things like that. Okay, pretty much everything else that was eaten was grown in what you would call their um, kitchen garden. Both their field garden and their kitchen garden was laid out in quadrants. The quadrants, you know, the remnants of the quadrants in today's farming practices would be the classic, I assume it's the same rotation here that we're using up around slating tin, field corn, soybeans, and winter wheat. So it's that, that rotation is the remnants of, of how they would lay out their quadrants. I'm not making any sense now, let me back up. They would split their, their farm into pieces, 
they grow something here next year, this year, and then move it for the next year, move it again the next year. Today, at least up in Slavington, in that area, they'll take a field, they'll plant probably soybeans first, and that the nitrogen from the soybeans is good for the corn, so the corn goes in next, and then the winter wheat follows that, and on a three-year rotation, they'll plant all three of those in the same field. The oldest surviving plans, the oldest documentation of a garden laid out in Quadrant came from Switzerland about 800 AD. So that's uh, over 1,200 years ago. Now, people were probably using something similar that before. <coughs> there were some monks in Switzerland who actually sketched it out, gave sizes, and made recommendations about rotations and things like that. <coughs> Anybody rotating their crops in their gardens at home? So I got a couple hands. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> the kitchen garden, always near the house for ease of access. Always employed raised beds. How many people here are using raised beds? A lot of people. Now, you, folks that are using, is that something that you were doing when you were growing up too, or is it just something you adapted later in life? Later. 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 Adapted to the soil. Adapted to the soil. So, okay. Lots of reasons for going to it, yeah. We live uh, right along the Lehigh River. We have wonderful soil. Mm -hmm. The only reason we have uh, raised beds is because we're trying to make it look as much as one of these as possible. Um, the nice thing about raised beds, though, is, as I'm sure those of you who are using know it, it really helps drain the water out in the spring. They dry up quicker than if they're not raised. It's really easy to rotate crops. I know I have four squares now, so Tomatoes are in square A this year. It'll be four years before they get back to square A, and it makes rotating crops to manage pests a lot easier. You don't have to think. You just have to remember where they were the year before. Um, kitchen gardens were generally used to grow vegetables, small fruits, and herbs. They grew a few flowers, but, but there wasn't a lot of space allotted in the traditional Pennsylvania Dutch garden to flowers. It was all useful plants from a perspective of either medicine or, or food. Men built the bed, spread manure and turned the soil. The women planted seeds, weeded and harvested. And my really comment there is because I don't see any women planting seeds, weeding or harvesting in my garden. So <laughs> wherever they are, if you could send them up to slave, then I would appreciate it. <laughs> she takes care of my sled dogs though when I go out of the country on business, so I can't say too much about not being Exactly. <laughs> Teach the tomatoes how to howl. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have plenty of howling. Uh, the field garden, it usually went where the soil was best, not necessarily close to the house, so you might have to take a walk to get to the field garden. Uh, they used, I, I used the term space hogs here, either because they planted a lot of things like cabbage, or because they took up a lot of space. They, they, they would put those out in the field garden. Um, generally managed entirely by the men. I'm okay with that because I have a, a tractor with a tiller, so I'm okay with doing that homework on myself. <laughs> There's a picture. I don't know how well you can see it. Am I holding that? No problem. I'm going to try to, to walk you through this. Questions, comments, please interrupt. All right? This is a typical, uh, classic, four-square Pennsylvania Dutch garden. Four-square because these four areas here is where the vegetables were being grown. The white is the paths in between. Okay? It seems like the typical dimensions were one perch, one perch on both sides. Anybody have any idea what a perch is? Sixteen feet. Sixty six. Yeah, I thought it was sixty six feet. I thought it was more than sixteen. But who knows? <laughs> but so so typically it is square, yeah. and then there's four squares inside. Okay, uh, the perimeter of the garden would always have a fence, and the fence would always be a picket fence. Why a picket fence? Yeah. Points keeps points keep the goats and everything out. Yeah. <laughs> points, you know, picket fence not so much like today where we have the spaces, but the pickets were up tight against each other to keep the animals out. Points on top is to pre prevent things like uh, groundhogs and raccoons from crawling over the top. Okay. 
I can vouch for the fact that it doesn't seem to bother any of the raccoons of its leaf. <laughs> so, so, so we now have the electrified horse fence along the bottom of our picket fence and along the top of our picket fence. And what do you do for deer? You know what? For whatever reason, and we have tons of deer. There are schools of deer. You know, schools of deer, herds of deer. Herds of deer. There's tons of deer, you know, you know, and uh, they'll get in my orchard, but they, they really haven't messed with the garden. And, and now I hope I didn't just jinx myself. I mean, they're all going to be gone. Yeah, they cost a bit. It may help that there's about 15 feet between uh, my garden and my dog kennel. So that may be oh, suggesting yeah, yeah. to the deer that they don't really want to get that close to the garden. In the center of a traditional four square garden is a patch with a special plant which I first came across in some of the writings as an Adam and Eve plant. Anybody have any idea what an Adam and Eve plant is? I see some people nodding. Fig? Nope, not a fig. Yucca. Yes, yucca. It's a yucca plant. Now, that apparently has some religious significance. I have not been able to find that any place. If anybody knows what the religious significance is, why it's called the Adam and Eve plant, I'd love to know, but I haven't been able to find that documented any place. Another common name for it is Adam's needle. Adam's needle is another common name. That's what we always call the problem. Adam's needle. So, so traditionally, that will be in the center of the garden. Uh, the walkways were packed earths, and this is not drawn, drawn uh, correct from a perspective of dimensions, because uh, typically they would be about 18 inches, the walkways. And I, I just, you know, that just blows my mind away. Maybe I'm a klutz, but I have a problem with 18 inches. I have a problem walking in an 18 inch path. So mine are, are like 32 inches wide, because that's how wide my tiller is. So see, that lets me get the tillers in there, which I never do anymore anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> but 18 inches is just way too narrow for me. Um, there were smaller people in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Probably more, less clumsy. Uh, around the outside, they would grow small fruit and medicinal herbs, maybe some cucumbers. So by small fruit, I'm thinking raspberries, strawberries, things like that. Uh, medicinal herbs, I, I don't, you know, there's lots of them that we could start going through that they would grow. Um, and they were very careful once the beds were prepared not to walk on them, which is a good idea to prevent soil compaction. They would lay a, a board down and they would uh, walk across uh, the board uh, doing their work. And I can tell you that's another thing that I'm not able to do. So I, I tend to try to work as much as I can from around the outside so my beds aren't any bigger than I can, can reach in to get. All right. Questions, comments? No, huh? <laughs> Remember, I warn you, my wife will tell you, I'll just keep talking if you don't interrupt me. All right. Oh, good. Here's something. Since, <laughs> since, since, since I didn't clean my garden last fall, because every fall I don't clean my garden because I'm anxious to start working my sled dogs, <coughs> I couldn't take a picture of it to put it in here this year to show what the four spirit garden looks like. However, last fall I did go down the Landis Valley. How many people live in the Landis Valley? Love that place. And I took a picture of their four square German garden. Mm -hmm. For those of you who aren't familiar with, with Landis Valley, if you get a chance, take a drive on down there. They have three generations of German farms rebuilt down there mm -hmm. with uh, demonstrations of the farming and gardening techniques were used. And then they also have all the different houses from the village from the time appropriate. But I don't know how well you can see this, uh, but they actually. Yes, so, so um, if you can see this, this is one of the four beds. And then there's another bed over here, another bed behind that, and a bed here. You can see the, the planks that they were using to walk across the garden to try to minimize soil compaction. You can also see the picket fence, not very well, but it is a picket fence. And on the next picture, you can see the area around the garden where they would grow the brambles, the cucumbers, the strawberries, and the medicinal herbs. And they have everything very nicely labeled there. And you can get a feel by looking around the pictures for the types of buildings you'll see if you go down there. They have old barns with heirloom oxen in them and heirloom sheep. 
uh, and they also have, as long as I'm here now talking about it, they have a wonderful uh, activity going on there called the Heirloom Seed Project. And they are breeding, not breeding, they're, they're collecting seeds, growing and collecting the seeds for varieties that are specifically grown in the Landis Valley during the years that these types of farms were, were being used. Uh, they used to have a really nice seed catalog like this, but this was the last year they put it out, which was uh, 2003, and now, unfortunately, all they have is, is this. And on the back it says, Urban Garden Fair, May 8th and 9th, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and their artwork on the front, cleverly enough, is a four-square German garden. I'll pass that around in case anybody wants to look at it. Um, so so the, the big point here, remember, uh, picket fence, keep the animals out, four-square garden to help rotate, to help make it easy to rotate crops. Don't walk on the soil, prepare the beds every year, pass in between herbs and fruits around the outside. That's pretty much what most of the sources on Pennsylvania Dutch gardening will tell you. That's what people did. Now, many variations of that. Anybody been to Burnside Plantation in Bethlehem? Also Pennsylvania Dutch garden. Okay. But they have 20 some beds. Okay, so it's a much bigger garden. They have all the beds. They have grass between the beds, which I'm looking at that thinking, who wants to cut that grass around each bed every week? Uh, but they also have around the outside uh, the area where they grow the brambles and the herbs. But that's another great place to go sometime if you want to see a Pennsylvania Dutch garden historically correct for hey. Yes. So why exactly did they do it this way? Was it more efficient or what did they find? So, so the advantages of it, the raised beds allow things to dry out and heat up more in the spring. Uh, they also make it easier to, to add uh, uh, manure, fertilizers, things like that. Um, and by doing the raised beds with the pathways and the boards, they don't ever step on the soil, so they don't compact the soil, which is better for the plants. It's easy way to do crop rotation, because you just grew my tomatoes were good last year, I'm going to one bed over this year. So the, that combination is what led to that. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania Dutch, I say the third, so I'm not sure this applies strictly to Pennsylvania Dutch. But apparently they're the first to pen their animals. And that's important because it facilitated the collection of manure and made it easier to spread the manure out in the gardens in the fall. Found a number of sources that referenced that, but it was unclear whether they were saying the Germans of Germany were the first to do that, or the folks here in Pennsylvania were the first to do that. <clears throat> people, I hear people, I see some people looking like they're not sure. Have we heard other, other on that? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and I will tell you, my grandparents planted everything by the moon signs, uh, which I actually haven't done too much of because the moon signs never seem to agree with my schedule, so <laughs> just ain't gonna work. The one thing I did do the first couple of years after I got out of college and the first couple of gardens we had, we did try to plant our potatoes on St. Patrick's Day, and at least in Slatington, that works like once every three or four years. Yeah. We can actually get in the garden to do it. So. It wasn't good this year. <laughs> <laughs> this year we had at least a foot of snow on the ground on St. Patrick's Day, so it wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> Um, also, they used to plant onions and cabbage on St. Gertrude's Day, and, and uh, I haven't been able to find much out about her except that she was a, a, a saint from Germany. And, but, but other than that, I, I didn't actually understand what they were telling me she did, so uh, she apparently wrote a lot. That's not too far off the St. Patrick's Day. No, it's the same thing. My, my grandmother always said you plant your peas on Good Friday. And I said, well, it varies, Grandma. She yeah. says, well, that's all right. <laughs> Do it, it's all right. <laughs> There is a theory, in case you didn't know, there is a theory behind the moon signs, which is that if the plant makes its yield above ground, its fruit or its leaves that you're going to eat above ground, then you want to plant it when the moon is ascending, and that's in the constellation Gemini. And the uh, exception being pole beans, which you plant in the bowman so they can climb the pole. What's a bowman? What's a bowman? I, I believe that's the, the archer, and I can't think of the name of that constellation. Oh, Sagittarius. Yeah. 
Uh, below ground, you plant in Libra when the moon is descending. But, you know, it's interesting. If I go through the books that I have, and then if I pick up the Farmer's Almanac, I'm going to find differences in, in what each of them says. So. <clears throat> okay. Heirloom seed varieties. So, old seeds. What, what, what did the Germans plant? Now, most of the information here came from a, a CP that I got from a study that a college did where they went around and looked at paperwork from a bunch of old farms in Pennsylvania and they listed what varieties were grown where. Okay? For what it's worth, Gudasumi, Guda, I didn't say that, Gudasumi, Guda Garth. Who speaks Pennsylvania Dutch here? Okay. Good seeds, good garden. Okay? To this day, this is a quote out of one of my books here. I believe it's this one on heirloom vegetables. Just a reference I used to, to get information on heirloom vegetables. To this day, Pennsylvania Germans retain a closeness to the soil that goes beyond mere occupation. It has religious overtones. German immigrants treasured seeds and cuttings carried from their homeland and they had a strong desire to preserve them. And if you grow heirloom vegetables at all, you'll know that there's just a preponderance of vegetable varieties out there that are identified as being German or Amish or Pennsylvania Dutch. Not just tomatoes, all sorts of other things. 